Hi everyone, welcome to Lakeside Church's online worship service. Thank you for coming today. I'm Christian Becker and I greet you today in Jesus' name. We have resumed in-person gatherings with physical distancing precautions, so if you're nearby, we invite you to come and worship with us each Sunday at 10.30 a.m. Remember, you can send me a message, a prayer request through Facebook or through our website. And please like our Facebook page when you check it out. Uh, Remember to share our weekly posts about the Sunday worship service to your timeline. That way more people will see them. All right, today our call to worship is from Psalm 30. David says, I will exalt you, O Lord. Sing to the Lord, you his saints. Praise his holy name. O Lord, my God, I will give you thanks forever. Let's lift our voices in praise to Jesus the Christ, our great God and Savior. I invite you to sing along as we sing the hymn, Praise Him Praise him, Jesus, my blessed Redeemer. you join me as we pray together. Almighty God and our Heavenly Father, we have gathered again today to sing praises to your name and glorify our Lord Jesus Christ. 
Thank you for the health and strength we enjoy to gather. Thank you for your promise to meet with us in Jesus' name. Help us to see you today as you really are and to hear from you through your holy word. We love you, Father. We thank you for meeting with us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, we invite you to sing another uh, song with us, a chorus. If it's new to you, uh, it's called But For Your Grace. And listen and then sing along. You know, some of these courses repeat and you'll get the melody. But it's a beautiful course about God's grace in our life. Before we turn again to the Word of God, would you join me briefly as we talk to the God of the Word. Almighty God, we worship you today in the beauty of your holiness. Thank you for cleansing us, cleansing us from sin through the blood of Jesus, the spotless Lamb of Calvary. We're ready to hear from you. Please speak to us from your Word. Open our eyes to see your truth. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing in your sight. O oh, Lord, our rock and redeemer, we ask this in Jesus' name. 
Amen. You know, some people don't like to think about the future at all. Comedian Woody Allen once said, It's not that I'm afraid to die, I just don't want to be there when it happens. <laughs> ah, the future. Last week we studied Jesus' teachings in Mark chapter 13 about the future end of the age and what the sign would be for his return. His answer wasn't as exact as we would like. He revealed some things to help us know when it's near, and it does seem to be near, doesn't it? But he said that only God knew the day or the hour. And Jesus refused to set a date, and we follow his example. You know, when we face troubling news like that about the end times, like this little girl, we need to know what to do. What what do I do with this information? What do I do about it? We need good advice, don't we? Well, there was a woman who once faced knee surgery, and she was quite nervous about it. So she asked her boss, a veterinarian, for some good advice. You know, what should she do when she had the surgery? And the veterinarian was glad to help her, and without any hesitation, told her this. He said, turn your worries into prayers, get plenty of rest, and don't lick the incision. (laughs) That's good advice if you have a dog, right? (laughs) But we need two out of three isn't bad, I guess. But we need some advice. Well, based on what Jesus said, there's no reason that his return in the end of the age couldn't happen soon. So what is his advice? Well, we ended last time with Jesus' words of advice. He warned us to not be deceived, to be on our guard, to watch and be alert. And so that raises a question for us. How can we live so as to be alert in these times? You know, it's an old storyline in Westerns. I used to be a fan of Westerns when I was a kid. I don't know if any of you were, but there were a lot of great Western shows on when we were younger. But do you remember in some Westerns, uh, the bad guys would always post a guard outside their headquarters. And after a while, nothing's happening, so the guard kind of gets sleepy. And what happens next? He nods off to sleep, right? And uh, the good guys are waiting just around the corner. When the guard drifts off to sleep, they rush in, they tie him up, right? And they capture the bad guys. Well, what happens with that guard is the opposite of alertness. The opposite of alertness. Uh, I have a son-in-law that used to be in the Army, and when he was stationed at Fort Knox, he said it was a real challenge to keep his men alert in a state of readiness because they were stationed on U.S. soil, and it didn't seem to be a threat anywhere. And so it's easy to just kind of let your guard down. The result was they're they're lulled into complacency. And we face the same challenge, folks, in these end times. We face the same challenge. Today we're uh, uh, we're gonna look at some of the things that Jesus said, but first of all, I wanna ask you, do you remember playing this game? Hide and seek, yeah, 98, 99, 100, and then what do you say next? Ready or not, (laughs) here I come. Well, uh, we need to see what Jesus tells us, how to be prepared for his return, because ready or not, he's coming soon. Turn with me in your Bible to Luke chapter 21. Luke chapter 21, if you have a copy of God's Word, we're going to direct your attention to verses 34 to 36. And uh, this is Luke's version of Jesus' end time sermon that we studied last week in Mark 13. Okay, so this is Luke's version. He adds a few things that Mark didn't add. So Luke chapter 21, beginning at verse 34. Jesus is talking, he says, Be careful, or your hearts will be weighed down with dissipation, drunkenness, and the anxieties of life. And that day will close on you unexpectedly, like a trap. For it will come upon all those who live on the face of the whole earth. Be always on the watch, and pray that you may be able to escape all that is about to happen, and that you may be able to stand before the Son of Man. So Jesus tells us a a number of things here that we can do. And the first thing that we must do to prepare for Jesus' return, he tells us is to anticipate the day of Christ. Anticipate the day of Christ. In other words, prepare, get ready. He says, be careful, that day will close on you unexpectedly like a trap. Uh, The King James says, take heed for yourselves. That day will come on you unawares like a snare. A snare is another word for a trap. Why do we have to do this? Because it's going to attract trap some people unexpectedly, unexpectedly. The word snare here suggests someone who hunts birds. Do you know what that's called? It's called a fowler, someone who hunts birds. And the fowler hides behind a rock or a tree, 
and he watches a field where he's put some grain. And he watches as the birds come down to feed. And at first, the birds are looking around, but when they don't see any danger, they become distracted in picking up their food. And suddenly the fowler swoops in, he lifts the net, and with one quick move, catches the bird. The bird isn't expecting the hunter, and so it's trapped. And people today don't expect Jesus to return anytime soon, do they? And Jesus predicted it would be like that when he returns. If you have your Bible, turn back a couple chapters to Luke 17 and look at verses 26 to 30. Jesus says, Just as it was in the days of Noah, so also will it be in the days of the Son of Man. People were eating, drinking, marrying, being given in marriage up to the day Noah entered the ark. And then the flood came and destroyed them all. And then he says it, it was the same in the days of Lot. People were eating and drinking, buying and selling, planting and building. But the day Lot left Sodom, fire and sulfur rained down from heaven and destroyed them all. It will be just like this on the day the Son of Man is revealed. Now Jesus' emphasis here obviously is on the suddenness of his return and the judgment that will come upon the whole world. But there's another similarity here I don't want you to miss. Jesus said, just as it was in the days of Noah, and as it was in the days of Lot, so also will it be in the days of the Son of Man. Now let me ask you this, what effect did righteous Noah or righteous Lot have on their culture? It's not a trick question. How many people were saved besides them and their family? Big goose egg. They had zero effect on their culture. They were both called righteous men. Okay, And what effect is the church having on our culture today? Is lawlessness and immorality increasing or decreasing? Just like it did in the days of Noah and Lot, it's increasing, isn't it? So that's another similarity that I want you to think about, as it was in the days of Noah and Lot. Something to think about. But back to Jesus' point. When Jesus does return... Will you be trapped or will you be ready, anticipating it? It will come just as unexpectedly for some people today. Life lulls us into laziness. We think life is going to go on as it always has. Think with me for a moment about how we age. For those of us who are older, it kind of does almost seem like yesterday we were a child and then we, we were going into high school, we were a teenager, and all of a sudden we graduated and then there's you, young adulthood, and all of a sudden... Boom, you're a senior citizen. <laughs> it's like, what? 50th reunion? Are you kidding me? It happens, doesn't it? A lot quicker than we think. And just as some people are not ready to retire, many will not be ready for Christ's return. Are you? The Bible says that everyone will be affected. The Bible says, for like a snare, as a snare it shall come on all them that dwell on the face of the whole earth. This is going to be a worldwide event. And some people are going to be trapped. He says like a bird in a snare. Once a bird is trapped in a snare or net, it struggles and struggles, but it can't escape. And those who put off getting ready for Christ's return will suddenly find themselves trapped. And when Jesus calls a time of great distress, unequaled since the beginning of the world, remember we saw that last week, Luke goes on to describe this. He says, There will be signs in the sun, moon, and stars. On the earth, nations will be in anguish and perplexity at the roaring and tossing of the sea. Men will faint from terror, apprehensive of what is coming on the world, for the heavenly bodies will be shaken. You are ready if you've put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ to save you from your sin, aren't you? If you come to God and, and you turn away from your sinful self-centeredness and you say, Father, please accept and adopt me, not for what I have done, but for what Jesus Christ did for me on the cross, you become a child of God and you are ready. You are ready for that day. If you have any doubts about whether or not you're ready to face God, don't put it off for another day, folks. Let me know. Let's sit down. I'll open the Bible with you and answer your questions. So we must anticipate Jesus' return. What is it that will distract people so they are trapped? Think about that. What will distract people? Once you're anticipating Jesus' return, the second thing we need to do to prepare for his return is to avoid the dangers of life. 
Avoid the dangers of life. Jesus says, be careful or your hearts will be weighed down with dissipation, drunkenness, and the anxieties of life. Now remember, he's talking to his disciples here. All right, this is to followers. Be careful, you know, you're gonna, your heart's going to be weighed down. In other words, he's saying, you're stay, away, stay away from life's hazards. And there's three distinct dangers that Jesus highlights here and he wants us to avoid. First of all, he mentions the dissipations of life. He says, be careful or your hearts will be weighed down with, the King James says, surfeiting. Uh, newer versions say dissipations. What's he talking about here? The idea here is carousing uh, at a lively drinking party, revelry, living it up, partying, or just overindulging, overindulging in food and drink. And today that is a huge problem with especially what group? The younger generation, especially. Uh, high school students are doing what college students used to do a generation ago, and college students are partying harder than ever. We live in a college community. And it's just amazing. Every year the police are called out, somebody's partying, too much noise, drinking, all kinds of crazy stuff going on. The dissipations of life. Now, most of you don't look like party animals to me, but looks can be deceiving on Sunday morning in church. <laughs> so Jesus says to be careful about the dissipations of life. The Bible tells us in the book of Daniel, chapter 5, about Belshazzar. You remember that story? He was the king of Babylon who saw the handwriting on the wall. This is the origin of that expression. You hear it all the time used. It's a Bible expression. Remember, a hand appeared and wrote, Many, many, tekel you farsin, it meant you've been weighed in the balances and found wanting. And he died because he was partying when he should have been alert to an enemy invasion. For many, the overindulgence in food and drink is a distraction today. We Americans love to eat and drink, don't we? Uh, just watch what happens in a, new t in a town when a new restaurant opens. Ever noticed? I don't know if what it's like in Bedford, but where we live, I mean, people show up, big crowds of people to check out the new restaurant. And then when we eat out, I'm amazed at the amount of food that they serve and the amount of food that people eat. And that can lead to overeating and, uh, uh, and then obsession with weight loss. And then people, that's all people think about. And before you know it, we're not even thinking about the return of Christ or being prepared. As Christians, we need to be alert. It's so easy to get caught up in the spirit of the age. After the dissipations of life, there is a second danger Jesus mentions, and I'm calling it the stimulations of life. The stimulations of life. He says, be careful or your hearts will be weighed down with drunkenness. People like to drink because it stimulates them. It provides some excitement in a boring life. Professor Arnold Toynbee, a historian, Observe that one of the signs a nation is on its way to ruin is, listen to me, a craze for excitement. One of the signs that a nation is on their way to ruin. Craze for excitement. Let's have some fun, right? It becomes the measure of everything. It's been that way in America for a long time. Are we having fun yet, right? Americans are addicted to excitement. How we love our theme parks, don't we? And our shopping. King's Dominion, Disney World, and then if you've ever been to the Mall of America, it combines both shopping and a theme park inside. Just an amazing place. There are people today who don't care what happens as long as they're having fun. They live in search of one thrill after another. And if it's not alcohol, then it's drugs or sex. Or how about extreme sports? That's become a big business. Bungee jumping, skydiving, base jumping. Ever heard of that? Where people jump off of buildings, bridges. Okay, there was just one in the news the other day where a guy jumped off a building and crashed into the building, broke his leg. People are in search of excitement. How about running with the bulls? That's an extreme sport, right? Or, they're at, or something else, until we're drunk with excitement and then we're distracted from spiritual things. Christian friend, what do you need to keep you stimulated? What is it you long for most? We need to be so careful because even legitimate things can end up mastering us and we become slaves to them. Even money, strange as that may sound. Uh, there was a story years ago in one of the McGuffey readers. Anybody here remember McGuffey readers? Yes, for over 100 years, from the 19th to the 20th century, they were used to teach reading and morals to children. And one of the McGuffey readers told the true story of a miser who hoarded a large amount of silver and gold in a secret basement 
under his house. He would often go down into the basement to look at his money and hold it in his hands. And one day, a strong gust of wind blew the door shut to his secret basement. A spring lock that could only be opened from the outside snapped shut and locked the miser in with his gold. Sometime later, the house was sold and workmen found his skeleton stretched out on the gold. It was a true story. He made money his God, and his God destroyed him. Now, in our culture, gods of wood and stone don't appeal to us, and so we don't think of ourselves as idolaters, do we? We, we kind of disdain these, these pagan idol, idols. They were just kind of, you know, they weren't as smart. They were dumber than us, right? Uh, instead, what do we worship? We worship gods of steel, plastic, and glass, also known as automobiles or boats or houses, or antiques, or video games, or sports, or large screen TVs, or smartphones, the latest one, or computers. Oh yes, Americans are idolaters, but it's a respectable idolatry instead of a crude idolatry. It's modern idolatry instead of ancient idolatry, but it is still idolatry, folks. Things take God's place in our heart, and we turn a good thing into an ultimate thing. My life will have meaning if only I can fill in the blank. That's your God. Well, we've got have the it, this dissipations of life. We've got the, the drunkenness, the stimulations of life. And then Jesus tells us about a third thing, the occupations of life. He says, be careful or your hearts will be weighed down with, the King James says, cares, newer versions say, anxieties. Things that occupy our attention in life. Life is so busy. One of God's greatest gifts to us is work. You remember Adam in the Garden of Eden? He had work. He had a job. Do you remember what Adam's job was? He was a gardener. That's right. He had to keep the garden. It was a job. Okay. Even in paradise, there was work. So work in and of itself is good. It's a good thing. It's what we do with it sometimes. Carry to an excess, we can become workaholics. Plagued with occupational hang-ups and burnout. Pastor Adrian Rogers said, If Satan can't make you bad, he'll make you busy. And one of the things of our age that makes us busier than ever is social media. Okay, and you see some of them pictured up there. And If you're not careful, it'll take over your life. The cares of this world, which God never intended us to carry, press in on us until we can hardly breathe. And folks, let me tell you, it can happen even in ministry to pastors. Socrates said, beware of the barrenness of a busy life. Beware of the barrenness of a busy life. Even too much service can sap your spirituality and smother you. And that's in normal times. Then there's this year. <laughs> to say we've had a lot of cares and concerns in 2020 is like a classic understatement, isn't it? Someone says that the year 2020 is going to become a byword for bad times. You know, in five or ten word, years, people are going to talk about something that's terrible and go, oh, that's all of 2020. <laughs> I think they're probably right. Maybe you can identify with Charlie Brown when he says, my anxieties have anxieties. <laughs> I like Charlie Brown. He's so honest. What can we do with our cares and our anxieties? The Bible tells us. The Bible tells us. Peter tells us in 1 Peter 5, 7, he says, casting all your cares, all your anxiety on him, who? Jesus, because he cares for you. Only then can we maintain alertness and prepare for Jesus' return. What are you doing with the cares of your life? Okay, so you're anticipating Jesus' return. You're avoiding the dangers of life. The third and last thing that Jesus says here in this passage that you must do to prepare for his return is you must assume the duties of the watch. Assume the duties of the watch. Look at what he says here in verse 36 of Luke 21. He says, Be always on the watch and pray that you may be able to escape all that is about to happen and that you may be able to stand before the Son of Man. Pay attention to what God is doing in the world. 
Be on the watch. Instead of giving us a list of instructions as we wait, Jesus summed up our responsibility in two words. Watch and pray. Watch and pray. That means we need to, I love this picture, stay alert. (laughs) Stay awake. Stay alert. Do your job. Stay awake and watch. What's our our job, Jesus? Well... (laughs) Seeking to save the lost. Make disciples. Build up one another in the faith. Serve one another. And if you're watching, it means that you are expecting something to happen. That's what it means to to be on the watch. You're expecting it. You're ready. Someone said there's three kinds of people. Those who know what happened. Those who wonder what happened. And those that don't even know that something happened. The Bible says in Titus chapter 2, verse 13, we are expecting the blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Does that describe you and me? I hope so. I hope so. According to God's word, we're going to be judged and receive a reward on whether or not we have longed for his appearing. Will you know what happened when Jesus returns because you're watching for him? Are you serving with expectancy? And the Bible tells us that this expectation leads us to live a certain way. Look at what John says in 1 John 3.3. He said, everybody who has this hope, talking about the return of Christ, everyone who has this hope in them does what? Purifies themselves. You keep yourself pure. Why? Because we're going to have to answer to Jesus for how we've lived. A good test for whether or not you should do something is whether or not you want Jesus to find you doing that when he returns. Purity of life leads to service. Watching is not loafing. Watching is serving, as the Apostle Peter makes clear. He says you ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. There are, sad to say, many Christians who fail to keep alert and watch. They're losing the battles of life every day. At the end, they will not be ready for the return of Christ. Are you ready? Are you ready? Be alert. Stay alert. And then another duty, he says, is to pray always. Watch, therefore, and pray always. The word always here can modify both watch and pray. Depending on the translation, you'll find it modifying watch, or you'll find it, I think it modifies both of them. We're always watching to always pray. Prayer is our communication with headquarters, folks. There are some who work hard at watching, but very few at praying. Folks, listen to me. If we really believe that God is in charge of this world, we would spend more time in prayer. Wouldn't we? If we really believe that he's in charge. Here's a place where we all need to grow. You know, I've seen grown men quake in their shoes when they thought the pastor was going to call on them to pray. We need to pray. What should, we, what should we pray for? Pray for deliverance from the evil one, folks. I believe that what we're seeing happen in our world right now, the lawlessness and the immorality, is a spiritual thing. It's a spiritual thing. Satan no longer has to hide. He's working out in the open and people still don't see him. Pray for deliverance from the evil one. Pray for victory. Folks, unless we know how to bend our knees in prayer, we won't know how to stand before Christ when he returns. Ministry without prayer is futile and fruitless. I don't know if you've heard this name, Charles Haddon Spurgeon, the Prince of Preachers. He was a great English preacher 175 years ago. He said that God blessed his preaching only because every time he preached, there were 100 men praying for him in a room right below his pulpit. Wow. Would you do that? His sermons were printed in newspapers around the world. He preached to 23,000 people at the Crystal Palace in London. They had to build a bigger church to hold all the people that came because he preached the word. He preached that he was faithful to the word of God and prayer. Only prayer provides the divine connection and power to overcome temptation, seduction, the allurements of the world, and your own inertia. What's inertia? It's one of the laws of thermodynamics. Do you remember your science class? A body in motion tends to stay in motion and a body at rest stays at rest. That's right. 
Have you noticed if you sit down to watch TV and you eat supper, if you don't get up right away afterwards, you end up sitting there all evening, don't you? <laughs> That's our own inertia. Prayer provides the power to overcome our own inertia. Martin Luther, the original, said this. He said, to be a Christian without prayer is no more possible than to be alive without breathing. Here then is Jesus' call to us to be alert. There is a day we're to anticipate, and it will catch some unexpectedly. There are dangers we're to avoid, the dissipations, the stimulations, and occupations of life. There are the duties of the watch we're to assume with an expectancy and purity of life that pleases the Lord while we pray always in victory. Folks, Jesus could come today. He could come today. Let's do what Jesus said and be careful. Take heed. Stay alert. And be awake to his coming. He's ready. Are you? One day soon, it'll be ready or not. Here he comes. Let me close with the same question I asked last time. Are you ready? Are you ready? If you're not, you can get ready today to live for Jesus and one day to meet him at his return. Remember, he loves you. He always has. He always will. Maybe you've made mistakes. Who hasn't? Who hasn't? Everybody in this room, including the guy behind the pulpit, has made mistakes. But God will forgive us if you come to him. What do you need to do today to be ready? Some may need salvation, to confess their sin, to repent, and to turn to Christ. Others may need to obey him and be baptized. Still others may need to take the next step and join the church and get on board with what God is doing in your town, in your county. Whatever it is, I encourage you to do whatever God has for you to do next. Would you pray with me? Lord, I want to pray for each person here today that you would help us to be alert. That you'd help us to escape the judgment of sin and to stand before Jesus Christ in his love with his approval when he comes back. Help us to avoid the dangers in life, to keep the watch and to pray always. That you may be pleased with us above all. Lord, we pray for this church that you would help us to reach out to the lost in our community. To serve the poor and the downtrodden and to point them to Jesus Christ who alone is able to save. Father, thank you. Thank you for your word and for its word to us today. Help us to be alert and awake so when Jesus returns, he will find us watching. I pray this in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Well, amen. Uh, amen. Our closing song today is The King is Coming. And I know many folks know this and enjoy it and I invite you to sing along with it. I can see the marching throng, the flurry of God's trumpets spell the end of sin and wrong. Regal robes are now unfolding, heaven's brand stands all in place, heaven's choir is now assembled, start to sing. Yeah.
Now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus make your love increase and overflow for each other and for everyone else. May he strengthen your heart so that you will be blameless and holy in the presence of our God and Father when our Lord Jesus comes with all his holy ones. Amen. God bless you, and Lord willing, I'll see you back here next week. In the meantime, remember, listen to the Bible. It's great for your soul. <laughs>